Hi, I'm David Pearl from Limerence.net, and um, I'm really delighted to have Brittany um, on the end of the, uh, the Zoom call today. Um, I, we were just chatting before I started recording, and I was saying that I remember when I was in the midst of Limerence many years ago, I came across this article. I think it was a blog post, and so, this person had written a description about limerence, and that, and it was quite, it was a very detailed article, quite a lengthy one. And I thought, wow, this is really insightful. This person really understands limerence, and uh, and then I I, I, don't, I can't remember if you put your age on it, but I found out that Brittany, who'd written the article, was only fifteen at the time. And how many years ago was that? I was a decade ago now, about. Right. <laughs> long so, time ago yeah and and other people have also made reference to a similar experience of coming across your article because a decade ago there wasn't much on limerence on the internet and i know that you've also touched other people and and they've been equally um a sort of uh astounded by your young age and a few times on the forum people have said oh what happened to that per that girl that read that article so it's <laughs> fantastic actually to at long last meet you and get the first-hand story. So let me hand it over to you. Tell us a bit about yourself, and um, let's see where it goes. All right. Well, yeah. So my name is Brittany. I did write that article um, when I was 15. I was a high school student. Um, that was around, I was going through what I would consider like a very serious limerence phase. And I mean, I feel like it was compounded even more because I was a teenager, so you know, you're getting into your first relationships, uh, trying to define what you like see love as and such as that. And I had a feeling, I was like, this doesn't feel like, I don't really like to use this word, but like normal, it, like it didn't really feel normal what I was going through. So I just, uh, I just like dove into the internet, wanted to see if there was anything that like I could define it as and I did eventually come upon limerence and that's when I it sort of clicked in my head I was like yeah that sounds a lot like what I'm going through and then that led me down like this rabbit hole of trying to find out more about it because as you said David 10 years ago there was not much on it at all so I got super into it and then I decided I was like you know I think I want to like write an article just about it just because, you know, there wasn't a lot on it. So I just wanted to help other people if they were going through like a similar thing as I did. And I was just really glad that it was received well and it did help a lot of people because as a 15 year old, it is a big deal to have even adults come in because I got I did get quite a handful of emails saying the same thing like oh like thank you for your article and it was just really moving to go through that it was almost intimidating because it did sort of I didn't feel equipped to like handle because there was a lot of people asking me for advice and I didn't really <laughs> feel equipped to handle that so I decided I was like I don't think I'm fit for psychology. This is kind of overwhelming. Um, so I did decide to do a different major when I first entered college. And then now finally I changed my major back to psychology and I am going to be a marriage and family therapist, hopefully in a few years. <laughs> so it's sort of gone full circle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and what what um what happened to your own limerence? How did you transition through it or what, what happened? I would say, I think it just, well, in that case, the limerence I was going through when I was a teenager, um, it just died out through starvation because it was uh, for a teacher at the time. And when I moved on to high school, I didn't see that teacher anymore. So it uh, it just sort of faded out. But there was that issue of... Uh, I guess like transference where especially like in my even in my later teenage years like when I was 18 19 I did have like those limerence or limerent tendencies were still there like if I ever got like a crush on a guy or something there like that pattern of thinking was still there and it was only when I went through 
like one or two like relationship like real relationships not just like crushes or you know like limerence for a guy where I sort of learned how to handle it a little bit better um I do have like sometimes I do overthink things when it comes to dating but I've just sort of I guess learning more about psychology too, like coping mechanisms, like stuff like that about my own like attachment styles. Uh, that's helped a lot with it. I feel like, but it's still sort of there under the surface, I would say. Do you want to, do you yeah. want to say, obviously I understand about attachment styles, but some of the people listening mm-hmm. might not. I've done some other videos on that, but do you want to just explain attachment and what end of this, you know, your attachment style? Yeah. So, um, did you want to do like a definition of attachment styles or? Yeah. It's still well, just how you see it. It's not, I'm not, it's not a test or anything. I just yeah, think it's yeah, yeah. Great. just yeah. great for you to just give a, you know, sort of, you obviously understand it and, uh, yeah. 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 yeah just oh, tell okay. us a bit about it. Yeah. So, um, do you know, attachment styles, um, uh, it is like based on, you know, the forms or the bonds you made with your parent when you were younger. And it's strange because I would definitely categorize like limerence to be more of like an anxious attachment style, certainly like an insecure attachment style. But I found at least with myself, because I don't think it's an all or nothing like attachment style, like you have different attachment styles, like with different kinds of relationships. Like I have very secure attachments with like my friendships and things like that but when it comes to like the romantic realm I would actually categorize myself as like avoidant but it's also strange because I feel like I also demonstrate like anxious attachment like tendencies but overall I would say it's avoidant like when it comes to healthy like secure relationships I see like I almost push it away because it feels safer to like, I guess idealize someone like it in a limerence like phase. Yeah, and uh, some people have that combination of anxious avoidant, and they have. The, yeah, the, yeah. The, if we're going to put a label on it, the worst. You know, it's not the best of both worlds. It's it's the worst of both worlds when it yeah. comes to attachment. Yeah. But, and and yeah. the way that in the couples work that Ruth and I do. Um, attachment really is at the core of um, it set up in the first few years of life. I mean, did you do any therapy or anything like that to better understand yourself at the time, or did you just work this out all yourself? Well, at the time, because I actually only really like started going to the therapy like a year ago, and that was when I decided I wanted to be a therapist. I was like, I should probably uh, go to therapy just because you know it helps, like when you're on the couch yourself, so to speak. But at the time it was just me processing things on my own. It was like, I didn't have any uh, sort of therapy. It was sort of like a self help thing, which I don't always recommend because it does help to have, um, you know, like an outside, like objective, like view on things. Yeah. But yeah. So I remember when I talked to my therapist about limerence, she she said, well, that's just a normal part of, of it's like a teenage crush. That's a normal part of growing up. And um, most people just grow out of it and don't have it again. But for some reason, some of us do. I mean, do you do you think that you might be a prone to get limerence again? Oh, yeah, for sure. I feel like it's certainly with like, certain kinds of people like people who have certain traits that like it's almost like a catalyst for it if that makes any sense yeah so what so how um since you got limerence and you wrote that article is that something that you've got quite interested in and and studied more or i mean or is it something that you're just going to leave behind and that's it you've been there seen that done that Yeah, no, actually, it is very much still, I wouldn't say I'd want to necessarily do research on it, like, you know, like academic papers. Um, But for sure, especially because I'm going into marriage and family therapy, I'm very interested 
and how it comes out in like affairs, like in marriages, because I think with affairs, I think a lot of it can be limerence. So that's also like, it's still an interest to me for sure. Yeah, I mean, our, our experience, I would say the vast majority of affairs, there's an element of limerence and, and it's the, because the person's in a committed relationship elsewhere, that's the driver for the limerences because they can't consummate the relationship. I guess I could ask you a question. Yeah, sure, go, go for it. Uh, since we were talking about attachment styles, do you, because in my head, like I said, I, I would categorize limerence as more of like, you know, the limerent is going through like an ancient, anxious attachment to someone who's like avoidant yeah. for whatever reason. Is that how you would categorize it? Or do you see certain, because obviously I think you've spoken to way more people who have gone through it and sort of treated them. Yeah, I, I think, um, I think sometimes with, with attachment, I think we can be two sides of the same coin and that we can flip. And it's, I think attachment is very situational. And as you've described it, like with your friends, you're securely attached, but in romantic relationship. Um, and, and what was interesting for me, and this is what I do see quite commonly, is that in our primary relationship, I'm the anxiously attached and Ruth is the avoidant. And we, we took us 20 years to work this out. And then I remember reading Pia Melody's book on love addiction. And it was, it, was a, it was an absolute light bulb moment. It was so obvious when I read it what was going on that I was constantly pursuing Ruth because I was the anxiously attached. I was looking for reassurance from her. Her mother smothered her and she hated being engulfed and that's why she's a, a, the avoidant. And I could never catch her because she was always running away into her bunker because that was her, her coping mechanism. And I, I, we could never work it out why we were constantly having these battles where I was needing reassurance and she just couldn't give it to me because she hated being smothered. And when we understood what was going on, all we had to do was turn towards each other and me stop pursuing her and her stopping running away and understanding our style. But what happened when I got limerence was really interesting. And, and the limerence was before we understood the attachment style was that um, I think the woman that I got limerent over was an avoidant by her default style. And um, I, I then became the avoidant in my marriage. Ruth became anxiously attached. She became really needy and was trying to smother me, and I hated her. And I was the, avo and I was the anxiously attached in the limerence to my limerent object. And uh, he... Um, I remember my therapist, when I was talking about this, she said, oh, well, you're getting a taste of your own medicine now. I mean, that's what it's been like for your wife for 20, 20 odd years with, with you being anxiously attached and constantly smothering her. And I absolutely hated it. So it was a really powerful lesson. And I, I do think, you know, I sometimes think, you know, why do these things happen? And uh, there's so many lessons that, that are as difficult and as painful as limerence has been. There's so many lessons that we can take from it. But the um, yeah, the question I was going to ask about atta your attachment style, because we know attachment forms early in childhood, and I don't know if you're if you're able or willing to. Um... Oh, and the other thing that's just popped back into my head mm -hmm. that I forgot to ask, I'll come back to it, is about shame. You know, we touched on it before. But your your own childhood. I mean, sort of. Can you tell us a bit more about what might have set you up for being limerent prone in early childhood? Yeah, I would. I would say overall, I my parents are still married. They've been married for, I want to say, almost 40 years. So, I mean, by outside definition, it is, I guess, a successful marriage. I do have decent relationships with both of them. Um, I would say I'm closer to my father. But now that I've gotten older and I see like you become more aware of like relationship dynamics in your family, like between your parents. And you also like learn more about that. You like see how you almost see like their emotional maturity levels, I would say. And one thing I have noticed as I've gotten older is because the relationship with my mom has always been, uh, I would say, not like contentious, but it was never like, I was never like very close to my mom. But as I've gotten older, I've noticed 
like she is very like I would say emotionally immature in some ways because you know she's been with my father for a long time since you know she was a teenager and I've noticed like the relationship dynamics in my family it is this is my own view like it's, it's not a diagnosis she's never been diagnosed but I would say she has uh, a lot of narcissistic tendencies and I think that is part of the reason why I because you know there's that cliche of uh because most of my limerence has been for like older male authority figures and there's that cliche of oh you have daddy issues and for me I always had a good relationship with my dad so it was never that but I have, I think, you know, my own theory is that it's uh, the insecure attachment I had with my mom. Yeah, and that's really interesting because I, I, I agree with you and I've seen it so many times where the issues are, are, are the same sex parent. Um, my limerence was all about my father. It wasn't, the, and, and the, the sort of yeah. qualities he held as well that my limerent object held. Um, so that's really interesting and you one of the things you touch on is something i really i see a lot again and that is that when we're growing up we think well, we don't have anything to compare our childhood to and right. if there's not overt abuse obviously if you've been knocked around or, or abused or sexually abused or all those horrific things it's 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 easy to understand where the trauma is but when there's what we call just benign neglect or parents who just through ignorance, not through malice or anything, just, just yeah. ignorance, don't know how to parent. Yeah. And that, and that's the problem. And I see this with probably everybody I work with, with limerence, that where with time you unpack the family dynamics and they start seeing a parent who, who yeah, was probably a little bit narcissistic, a little bit self-absorbed. It was all about image and, and, not, and the child being just an object, a narcissistic extension of the parent. And that's, in, that's what limerence is. So. I see that a lot. Let's come back to narcissism because it's often thrown around, and and oh. yeah, and it, I think it's a very abused term. And I, it's psychologically for me, it means something different. And I, I, I'm not a fan of labels. And I, and I think the problem with so many labels is they're very shaming. And so, and that's what I want to talk about shame. So, so what really struck me, you know, one of the things that I mentioned it already was that you put your name to your article, and we know with limerence that most people feel massive shame about about limerence and i just did a video about that a while back um and i certainly took a long time i reckon about nine months before i was willing to come out and actually put my name to what i had been writing or, or on a on the tribe forum which was the precursor so um and i think until until we start getting limerence more known and it not being a shaming condition it's just part of the human condition for some of us and as you said limerence is a big part of nearly most affairs and the, the amount of shame that's around affairs as well because people just project their own insecurities onto those that have been unfaithful but until we tackle that those issues a bit like i think being gay at one time or now with the trans movement where there's so much shame because people can't sit with their own difficult feelings around that but what was it you you at 15 what was it that allowed you to not feel shame about this having intense feelings for a teacher? <laughs> I think because I don't think I ever disclosed it in the article. And I guess being a teenager, that like I was a little bit naive. So at least in my head, I was like, you know, I think it, it probably would be completely different if I was an adult and I was I probably wouldn't put my name on it type thing but I guess because I was a teenager I did there was a little bit because I think I told you earlier I was like I took myself way more seriously back then so I did want that sort of recognition for it which is also why I put my name on it but yeah, like I said, <laughs> I took myself a little bit seriously back then. <laughs> so a little bit of narcissism coming out in your Yeah, for sure, for sure, yeah. As a 15-year-old, as a I think that's allowed. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> back then, yeah. But what ch yeah. children are highly narcissistic. I mean, that that's how they're designed to be, but hopefully we grow out yeah. of it. No. It, it. Oh, yeah, I, I think I have a little. <laughs> 
<laughs> what would you if so if you got limerence again and you were in a committed relationship, how would you how would you manage it? What would you do? I think do my best to probably because at least with me, like I can notice when like I can like if I have a feeling I can be like, oh, I feel like I could develop limerence for someone like given the right like I can almost like tell there's like a seed so to speak so I think like if it got to that point I would just do my best to not get to the idealization phase like I would do my best to like you know get to know the person better and not like place them on a pedestal so to speak and then in regards to being in a relationship I mean I haven't been in a situation where I was in like a committed relationship and I started to develop limerence for someone else. But in this like hypothetical situation, I think it's important to just almost bring it up in a like if it's a secure relationship and you have honest, like open communication, just to like almost say, like, oh, I have a crush on so and so, just so you're not because I think when you begin to hide it is when it grows more if that makes sense but as yeah. I said I've never been in that situation so. yeah and I, I agree with you and I think it's what you said there Brittany the secret is if you're in a secure relationship and you can trust your partner not to react in a way where you 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 fear their reaction and I think that's you know if there's one message I'd love listeners to go away with that, that who are in committed relationship is that is to get to a point of communication where neither of you, either or both of you don't fear the other person's reaction where you can manage conflict because I think it's the conflict avoidance that creates oh, yeah. so many problems. I agree. Yeah. So how are you going to take forward sort of your interest with limerence? I know you're training now to be a, a therapist or starting your training. Um, and how will you interweave your your interest in limerence into that? I think, because I'm not certain what exactly, like what population I'd like to focus on when I get out of school, like when I become like a practicing therapist. But I guess, because if you're being like a marriage therapist, and if there's ever the problem of like adultery or such as that and one married partner does confide in you like if they're having an affair I think it it's just helpful to have like a therapist who's at least aware of the term and can sort of bring awareness to it if that's something that's happening with them because I think I um when I was reading some of the forms you know when I was younger I think a lot of people who had gone to therapy said that their therapist had never heard of the term before. So I think even just being like aware of it, like as a therapist, um, can help like a client immensely with that. So would yeah, I and I, I think it's still the case that the therapeutic community is still largely ignorant. And I I think the word itself hasn't helped because it's not descriptive of what the condition is. Oh. It, yeah. yeah. When, when when you mention limerence, people just say, "What? What does that mean?" Yeah. So it's, how how could um so so would part of what you would like to do is sort of help spread the word because you know here you are and I've done all right, you're the, only the third interview that I've done. My plan is to do more. Um, however, you've been brave enough to be on the video as well, which is great. And you know, but my sense is a lot of other people still feel that shame and, and it's how do we as a, a community of therapists do more to get to, to let well, increase awareness of this and also to help people understand that this is not you know so many with affairs so many the betrayed person even the words are so awful betrayed and betrayer they're so judging and harsh but you know they say but the betrayed is so angry with the betrayer understandably and they and and when when i talk about limerence these they they attack me and say oh you're just you're just making an excuse for his or her midlife crisis generally his midlife crisis and that of course he had an ability to stop you know resist this and and we know that when you as you say once that seed gets planted and we start going down that that slippery slope it's really hard to come back unless we understand what's going on and most affairs, I believe, that they they're not intentional. 
You know, people just get to a point where the point of no return is too difficult, especially if there's reciprocation. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, and that, that, that's where it becomes problematic. But how it's removing the shame and stigma so that people can talk about that. So, you know, what would be great is if in five, 10 years, there you are as one of the experts in North America, because I don't, uh, oh. I know of one, I, I think is it Dr. Joe Beam, I think, who's got quite a lot of stuff on. I don't know if you've come across his work. Um, marriage uh, I haven't I've, uh, actually funnily enough I don't know if I told you but one of my professors who helped me uh, getting into grad school because um, I told him that I was interested in limerence and he was like oh I like he had heard of it before and he's like um, check out the writings of mm -hmm. it's this uh, he's in sex like in the sex therapy realm his name is uh, Dr. Barry McCarthy and he was like his definition of it is a little different than like what you're telling me so I read into Barry McCarthy and he seems to use limerence like his conceptualization is more like the honeymoon stage in relationships yeah. so yeah. there is also that catch 22 of the term being more widely used but in a, a not like in the way that you and I would yeah. for, like, like categorize it as yeah yeah and I just wrote that this morning and I've written it before. This is one of the problems is there's confusion over what limerence is. And a lot of therapists who have heard of the term or when you read articles, describe it as that honeymoon phase or that new relationship energy. I don't think it is because it's, it is different. It's where the barrier to consummation, like for you, being a teacher, being young, it wasn't appropriate. And that was the barrier. For me, I was married. But in a normal relationship, yeah, that new relationship energy is like limits. And I think neurochemically, it's identical. But we get caught in this obsessive cycle. And I think probably also we have a predisposition to obsessive traits as well that probably fuels it. And, and the anxious attachment and all the other stuff that goes with it sets us up for this loop that we get caught in. So, yeah, I, that, that, and that, that frustrates me that, even the therapeutic community that is aware of limerence, I and, and I don't think Tenov meant that originally when she described it. She didn't mean it as new relationship energy. Um, I agree. She, yeah, great. Yeah. Shame she's not here anymore to give us clarity on what she meant. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, let, well, let's go back to narcissism because this is a term that is so um, widely used and misused. Um, and I, I know that for many of us, that limerence, I think our limerent objects are, are mirrors for our own narcissistic traits. And when people come onto the forum and they start reading about narcissism and that how our limerent objects are narcissistic, um, they can't see that mirror in of their own traits in themselves. But if it's in the limerent object, you know, the saying, in, if you spot it, you've got it, it has to be in them as well. But that, a lot of people find that really hard to accept that, crikey, I might have narcissistic traits or however we're gonna do. Do you wanna? Yeah. And you, do, tell us a bit more about that and what you learned about narcissism. Well, I, I do agree. I think um, narcissist, like calling, someone a narcissist is like throwing it around because I think everyone to some degree has I like to say narcissistic tendencies you know everyone has an ego and things like that so I mean when you were saying that like in order to like see like a limerent object as like you know like narcissistic in a way because like you have narcissism traits in yourself like I, I would agree with that as I was saying, I, I think everyone has narcissistic tendencies and I don't think there's an issue. I mean, understandably, it's hard to accept that, you know, no one wants to think of them, think of themselves as an a-hole, <laughs> but um, I don't, I think part of it is taking away that shame because if you don't acknowledge it within yourself and you avoid it, it's not going to go away. I, th I don't think there's any shame in saying, yeah, I have some narcissistic tendencies. Yeah, yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And, and um, 
as my therapist used to say, they, David, you, you know, you only have to be perfectly imperfect. And I think, again, we live in a culture where everybody feels they need to be perfect. If I'm not perfect, then I'm broken, you know, I'm broken, I'm damaged in some way. I'm unfixable. And it's, I think, pe helping people just to accept themselves for who they are, you know, with all their magnificent bits, whether they're shadowy qualities or golden qualities. Have you come across the shadow, Carl Jung's concept of the shadow? Um, not, I mean, I've heard of it, but I mean, I would, like you were saying earlier, it's just part of the human experience, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's sort of the parts that we hide, deny and repress. I think it's, it's the unconscious that we, that we, um, we all have. I mean, what's your, what's your views on, on that? Because I've got, I've got a friend who's a really intelligent guy. He's just actually finished a course with Gabor Mate, you know, the, who's the addiction specialist, uh, Canadian addiction specialist. And, and he's a really bright guy. And he, he finds it really hard to believe that we have an unconscious. He, he's of the view that everything comes from a very rational place that we, and my experience hasn't been that. I mean, what, what, what's your view on how, how much of our drives in life are, are unconscious? I think, I mean, I, I do believe in that like unconscious motivation because I think it just goes back to if you're not willing to look at the parts of yourself that you don't like, then whether you like it or not, it's going to have an influence of your actions and how you behave, which is why I think it's so important to look at it and accept it. Because if not, then, you know, as you're saying, it's going to act act as almost like an unconscious drive. So with your own... you... Sorry, go. On. Oh, I was just gonna say, is that how you sort of see it or yeah, absolutely, yeah. And and the more um the more I understand about how the mind works for myself, the more I realize that actually I'm not so much of what I do is unconscious. Um, I like to think I make rational decisions, but uh, and I think we're great at we're sense making machines. We're great at making sense of every decision that we make. And yet, when I think back about why I did something, actually, I think it, uh, the the actual decision was quite unconscious. I'll give you an example that I've used before. And that um, during COVID, my elder, old, eldest daughter and her fiance came to stay with us, and. Um, I was having breakfast one morning and I switched chairs in the kitchen. And my, and Ruth, my wife said, you know, why are you sitting in that chair? And I said, oh, I want to look out at the courtyard. Um, it's a much nicer view. And she said, in 20 years, you've never sat in that chair. Why have you sat? Why are you sitting there now? I said, well, I told you, it's a much better view. And I can look this way and see the TV. I can look that way and see the courtyard and see the sun coming up. It's beautiful here. And she said, well, have you ever considered that that is where Aidan, that's my sister, my daughter's, um, Beyonce, that's where he sits. And have you considered that maybe you're sitting there because you're trying, you know, like the alpha male, you're trying to, you know, put your your scent down and tell him quite clearly, look, 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 <laughs> look, son, you don't sit where you want to sit. You sit where I, you know, where I tell you to sit. And I, I laughed at myself and I thought, you know what, that has to be the only excuse. And I, because I'm, you know, I'm trying to make um, sense of that. I come up with some actual bullshit reason why. Yeah, rationalizing. Yeah, <laughs> and, and I think Ruth was bang on, and I, th I and I, I think that's such a good example of an unconscious drive um, that, it, and that's that primal sort of mate guarding that's innate in all of us in some way of, of me just being the out, you know, the head of the house, the the, the, the alpha male, and and for me. A significant part, and I think one of the bits of huge gold of limerence was working out what was it unconsciously that I was seeing in the limerent object that I could, and this took me two years to work out. And once I worked out what those qualities were, it really helped me do some much deeper work on my relationship with my father because it was all to do with my father. But with um, with and but it did take that took a lot of work and a lot of and even now when I think back about it I think it's so obvious but at the time it wasn't. But for you, how did you manage to work out what it was in your teacher that what qualities they had that were sort of keying into? Do you want? Can you say more about that? 
Yeah, I would, I guess I would say, because I consider myself quite, you know, introverted. And most of my, well, I would say probably all of like the limerent objects I've had, they've always been very like extroverted, outgoing. So, I mean, I think part of it is me wanting to be more like that in combination of if I can, like, if they find me worthy for whatever reason, you you know, then I'm worth something because like, I see them as like above me. So getting that like attention from them, so to speak, makes me feel worthy. Like, so I would say it's a combination of both of those. Yeah. And and so, and and so is there a part of you that at times doesn't feel worthy enough or good enough and that's why you're seeking that from others? Yeah, for sure. And I would say that's also why I would say like in romantic relationships I'm like avoidant where like I would if so if I can see that someone, you know, is like into me then I'm like I almost get turned off by it but if I like chase someone and to like someone I put on a pedestal then that makes me like feel better about myself because I have to earn it if that makes sense Um, and what is it about somebody chasing you that turns you off have you worked that out um I guess it just goes back to the like if I don't, I suppose it's more of like, I'm trying to like put it into words. It's like, if they like me that much, then I'm using this phrase like very loosely, then they can't be worthy. Like if they're chasing after me, what's wrong with them? If that makes sense. Because it does go back to seeing, like, your sense of, like, self-worth. But like I said, I was using that phrase, like, very loosely. What, what, how, how does it tie into intimacy for you? About that word, when I say intimacy, I, I, I use it, I say into me see. It's about really opening our hearts and, you know, letting, being vulnerable, letting somebody in at, at, at a heart level. I mean, is that how you would... With, with, letting people in at a deep level so that you're vulnerable and you may get hurt because they may reject you or abandon you. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say it's, um, at least with romantic relationships, it's, it's scary, (laughs) you know? So I think that's why it's easier to chase someone than it is to, you know, let someone in who already likes you, so to speak. Yeah. So if you're chasing somebody, does that keep you more in control? Yeah, it's definitely, I would say, a control thing. Yeah. And that, and that I think that's at the heart of probably all relationships. It's about power and control. And, and my, my journey, it's been learning just to let go of control and just not worrying about stuff. And it, it's hard, I think, when I, I know that I can be quite a control freak. Um, but how does... Con- is, how controlling can you be? Is that something that's part of your makeup? Yeah, I mean, in a way, I obviously, you know, with certain aspects of life, I, I'm less controlling. But I would say over the years, I have had to work on being <laughs> less controlling, for sure. <laughs> and, and, and what other gifts did limerence give you, Brittany? What else did you learn about yourself from that whole experience? Oh, I just, I mean, I would say for for certain it's the catalyst of, I mean, it influenced the career I'm choosing, of course, but also, because like we were going back to like family dynamics, I don't think if I had ever gone through limerence, I don't think I would have had like developed the self-awareness to look at the family dynamics that like I have in my own family, because I see it because I have two other siblings and I've noticed that like it's allowed me to look at it objectively and say, I don't really, you know, like these family dynamics. You know, I, I can look at what 
is, you know, like a healthy, secure, like family dynamic. So it's allowed me to sort of like break away from that in a way. Whereas I see it with like my siblings, like they're, I don't want to say like stuck in it, but I would say they're not aware of it. Like it can be different than what it is. So, so how, that's really interesting. And how, how, how has it changed your relationship with your parents? This whole um, I would just, yeah, I'm, this is just my own perception. I, I haven't asked them about it, but I would sort of say I'm almost like the black sheep of the family. <laughs> Yeah. It's not, yeah, it's, it's not that I like actively dislike any of my family members. It's just, I've sort of distanced myself because I don't want to engage in, you know, the status quo, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. And that's so common. And and, and, I, and that was the same identical experience for me. I mean, I Limerence was the wake up call for me to look at my very enmeshed very sick dysfunctional family dynamics and three sisters and, yeah. and um who are still very enmeshed with my dad um and who, who's the consummate victim he wrote the dumbest guide on victimhood and uh plays into that and no i'm the only person that will challenge him and he absolutely hates it and gone through times of yeah the black sheet of the family where three years of no contact from my sisters because they hated me so much for daring to sort of point out just how sick and enmeshed our family system was. Um, it's tough, you know, but to me, I'm far happier. And now we've reconnected, but it's it's never going to be a, a deep, nourishing relationship unless they do their work. And my dad's 87, yeah. and I think that's pretty unlikely. So we, you know, we get on well, but it, it's still, it's never the relationship that a boy needs from his father. Um, right. And, and my mum got dementia just before I sort of got limerence. So I never managed to do much work with her on our relationship, which is one thing that always saddens me. My my therapist was of the theory that my mum knew because she was a, she was a very angry, violent woman towards me. And she was of the view that um, she escaped into her limerence because she knew that I was going to start having some very difficult, honest conversations with her, which I would have which I'd always feared because of this, mm. you know, um, this dynamic. And, and this is a problem with so many men, that they have mothers who, who wear the trousers in the relationship, uh, the fathers are passive, and they don't learn how to, well, I, I say to my male clients, to fight with women, but I don't mean physically fight, I mean just to, hold, yeah. to, to push yeah. back against the feminine energy. They're so fearful of it. And that was the case with, with me and Ruth, and that was one of the things that was playing out, and Limerence was taught me that as well. So many gifts from it. Um, so what what other advice, if somebody's listening to this talk for the first time and they've just come across the word Limerence, what, what, adv what, what suggestions would you give to somebody who's just got that, oh my gosh, moment? <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> so actually one thing I will say, I think in my article, I was really pushing like, oh, you should disclose your feelings to your LO. I, I wouldn't really agree with that anymore. The only way I would see it is if, like, you know, if you're both single, I don't think there's any harm in trying to date them, but I wouldn't make it into this grand gesture because that, like that's turning, limerence, I would say, always has something to do with yourself. It's less so about the other person. It's more like you were saying, it's like holding up a mirror to yourself in a way. So I guess just the advice I would give where you have that, oh shit moment where you realize, you know, limerence like fits what you're going through. I would just say, see it more as a, like a flag to like, sounds kind of cheesy, but to like look within yourself because it's telling you something. It's not telling you something new about the other person you're fantasizing about it's telling you something about yourself yeah I, I, that, I think that's great advice about the desire to disclose which is so powerful and, and I think most people that have disclosed regret it eventually it doesn't it doesn't remove the the cognitive right. dissonance that we're in what about yeah what about no contact what's your view on that one I think if it comes to the situation where 
you know, the relationship can't be consummated in any way, whether it's because, you know, someone is married or it's just become too toxic, so to speak. I think no contact is the way to go. For sure. At least to the best of your ability, because I know a lot of or at least I've read a lot of like anecdotes of people who are like, oh, I work with them or, oh, they're my neighbor. You know, it's harder to do no contact with that. But I think, you know, just distancing yourself as best you can is probably more of a way to go while you process through it. Yeah. I think that low contact is harder because we have to fight, dig so deep to get the the will, the willpower to, to not see them. Whereas if you go through to no contact, right, you go through the withdrawal phase and the pain, the psychological pain of withdrawal, then, then you can just start working through your own stuff. So yeah, that, yeah. that's true. Um, what, um, so you're, hopefully you're going to be one of the people that is out there spreading the word. What, what would, how would you like to promote yourself now? I mean, what, uh, is there anything you're doing now that people can go and look you up on and, um, find out more? Or... Um, I guess, I mean, still just right now, there's just, you know, that blog article I wrote. I don't have, I do hope to do something more like in the future when I feel more secure and capable of like talking about it. Because right now there is sort of that, I still don't feel like I'm very capable of helping people through it you know there is sort of that imposter syndrome going on but yeah i would just say blog blog article right now okay so if you if you if you uh, i'll link to your original article in in the description of the video here but if you um it'd be great if if and when you're ready just keep in touch let me know and i'll sort of put another link to to this video if, if there's updated stuff um what do you what do you want to ask me? Is there anything you want to ask me before we start wrapping up? Oh uh, yeah, let me um think, I guess. Cause I've always been because I think I might have read that because in my head there is sort of that theory I was thinking. I'm like, I think part of limerence comes from not exper- like having a lot of relationship experience. But I think I might have read that you have seen some people who have had like multiple relationships throughout their life, but they're still like they've fallen into limerence or they're prone to limerence. So do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, we we um, we did a poll on, on the forum, um, but that was the question was about sexual experiences. So it wasn't about long term relationships. Right. And certainly there was a, a widespread. Um, what, what I would say is that the clients I see who are having limerent affairs, and most of the people I work with come through the couple's practice, um, I would say that they got married, I was going to say too young, but that's, that's subjective, but they got married young. Um, and it's, they've only had one or two significant relationships. And that was certainly my case. I mean, I, I'd had one girlfriend for two years and and then I met Ruth and that was it. So I only had two significant relationships and I, I think I was too young. I got I met Ruth when I was 25. And I think the advice I see now for young youngsters is go and sort of so I don't like that word, so you wrote, but go and go and yeah, drive yeah. go and test yeah. drive a few cars before you um settle on the, on yeah. the model that you want. And um so, so I don't. I think there probably is some correlation between the two. But then, if you look at, um, I, I don't think that in itself is enough to sort of be a predictor. You work with, um, you know, some people have uh, arranged marriages and they work really well. And I think actually the stats for arranged marriages are, are slightly better. But the whole, I mean, this is something that I've been thinking about a lot over the last few months. And certainly when I got limerence, I started looking at monogamy and open relationships. And I think many of us do because it's a way of justifying pursuing the limerent object and still you know, having our cake and eating it. Um, and worked through that and decided that, no, I wanted to be monogamous because Ruth's view was, well, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And if you want to have a, an open relationship and pursue your limerent object, fine, but don't expect me to be sitting at home. I'll be going out with other guys as well. And, 
being insecurely yeah. attached. That was, <laughs> I'm very jealous that wasn't going to happen. But I, I do look at, you know, it's been 10 years since my limerence and I, I do look at the landscape of, of dating um, and we see more and more young couples and the, the online dating and the temptations and how the whole landscape is changing. And I, I do oh, wonder, yeah. I, and I, I think Esther Perel's writings are quite interesting around this as well, about is that we have three significant relationships in our lives and they're either with the same person and we have to re-engineer the relationship or we go off and have a new relationship. And I think that's very true. And again, we have to remove the stigma of divorce because, you know, if a relationship's run its course, and I think with, with lim, limerence for some people, it is, it is a, a, a calling that your relationships run its course. And I do see that. I think some relationships, perhaps they were better off just never being in the first place and you just have to go your own way. Um, but again, it's, it's, there's so much shame and stigma around divorce still, less so than it was, but... You know, I see it in the clients where they can't, it's very hard for them to separate or uncouple consciously, and especially if there's children. I mean, and obviously that's, that's the goal. But it's, I, I just think human relationships are so complex and, and we don't fully understand attraction and, uh, at the moment. And, and that's why I love this work because I just think it's, there's so much more still to understand and discover. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And the mystery, you know, and having gone through limerence, and I'm sure you'll relate to this, just the mysteries of that level of attraction that we can feel where we didn't, you know, I didn't even know my limerent object. And I don't know how well you knew your teacher when limerence started. But for most of us, we don't, well, we don't know our limerent objects. They're a fantasy. But how can it feel so real that we would destroy our marriages and, and hurt our families, which is what so many people do? You got me going here. I There's... <laughs> Uh, no, I mean, it, it's hard not to, you know, as you you were saying, because it's so complex. But I do like this quote. It sort of fits limerence. It's like, who wants to go back to Kansas once you've seen Oz? Where yeah. it's like, you know, you, yeah. going into this technicolor world and then it's almost like returning to, you know, gray and boring Kansas. I mean, it's not necessarily like a reality, but it's just a quote I think is really fitting for it. Totally. And, and I had literally the same conversation with my therapist, you know, how do I, how do I get this feeling back? How do I recreate it in other parts of my life? Um, I, I, I don't think, I, well, I don't know. I mean, I, I've got very curious about um, psychedelics. I haven't tried them yet, but I'm very interested in psychedelic research with psychotherapy. And we, in, the, in the UK, we just had a documentary on a couple of nights ago about the, re the research they're doing with... Um, MDMA and psychotherapy and the results are really interesting and I, I yeah, just wonder yeah just it's opening I just think there's other levels of consciousness and I do think for some of us limerence is a it's a, it's a quasi spiritual experience and it it accesses other levels of consciousness that we have lost due to our western ways of being and and the whole war on drugs has sort of suppressed that whole area of, of research into, you know, yeah. what else is out there. Yeah. And, and I think that's, again, that's fascinating. And I'm, I'm ever curious about trying to understand all this stuff. I mean, what did, for you, was it a sort of, even at the age of 15, was it, was that sort of an experience, a type of an experience for you that, yeah, I think, I mean, in retrospect, I see it more, like, when I was going through it, I don't think I had the, like, emotional skills or, like, self-awareness to, like, recognize it as such, but when I look back on it, certainly, like, I do see it as sort of that, like, eye-opening experience, so to speak, like, shining a light on something. So like you're literally like the third eye being you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah being, uh, the, the the third eye being opened up. What a nice description. Yeah. Any other questions before we wrap up? Uh, no, I just I was gonna make a comment. I do because you're saying like you know the Western world way of thinking of like of viewing things. Because I did think it was interesting when you said you know people can be happy in arranged marriages, and I think it goes back to that like western like world 
like idea that the one is out there, you know, like, so I think it does push people into, like, I would be interested in seeing how prevalent limerence is in other parts of the world. Yeah, that's interesting. And I, I, I do look at the stats of um, on the forum because I can see geographically where people are from and we've got the flags now as well. And it is quite, oh, yeah, a diverse, yeah. Yeah, it's quite a wide, diverse spread. But I think the challenge is that because the world is so global now, that, it, that even if you're of an of a Eastern, let's say a more Eastern culture, you're so exposed to Western values and ideals, uh, especially around romance and Disney oh, yeah. and Hollywood, that, yeah. that probably you know, in one or two generations, we've corrupted an entire entire generation of people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. and and uh, what, what i would say is that half of i reckon about half of our practice is um um children of immigrants like asian the asian community um uh african irish and i that there's something there as well around that trend that dislocation of from a homeland and move because we are such a mobile population now as well where where the children don't have roots themselves and um, they're insecurely attached, you know, literally because they don't they're not grounded in the land that they their 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 ancestors. Yeah, and and I mean this stuff. This I think Jung would call this Carl Jung the the un collective unconscious, and I yeah. and yeah, the sort of playing out as well with the transgenerational trauma that we all hold. Um, so, but I, I suspect that, like you, that limerence probably was less likely in in, in Eastern cultures. Um, I was going to say more primitive cultures, and yet that's such an arrogant thing to say, isn't it? Because that, you know, who's to say that we're more we're more developed in the West? Uh, you know, I, I don't yeah. think we are. We just it's just a different way of being. But I, I, the way the world's going at the moment, I hardly think we've got all the answers. Um, so. Just shows the conditioning, doesn't it? Certainly. Let's um, let's wrap it up there. But I really appreciate you coming on tonight. It's great to great to meet you at long last. Yeah, um, thank you for having me. Yeah, and stay in touch. And I'd I'd love to see in ten years' time you sort of having your own <laughs> own, own little gig of <laughs> doing yeah. them and stuff. I'm so I can take a page or two from you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, go well, Brittany, and uh, thanks right. again. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, David. I really uh, enjoyed this. Great. Bye. Bye. Bye.